Most every famous diamond in the world is represented in this case. They are worth many millions of dollars, and trails of blood, romance, and adventure follow the history of each gem. The Kohinoor is the most celebrated jewel in the world. Countless tragedies of love and war have been played for its possession, and now it rests in the British royal crown. And the lucky lady who wins this boy will sometime possess this jewel. While the public continued to imagine that all diamonds were rare and romantic, De Beers were mining enormous quantities. Oppenheimer saw that more huge finds might force prices to go plummeting downwards. In 1929, a De Beers mining engineer warned, the diamond market is dependent for its smooth and efficient functioning upon the illusion in the minds of the general public that the diamond is a rare and valuable stone. Oppenheimer's partner and De Beers director, Sir David Harris, also saw the implication. For goodness sake, keep out of the newspapers and parliament the quantity of diamonds that can be produced. But as the colonies developed, diamonds began turning up all over Africa. In the year 1931, in the morning I used to leave Kimley three o'clock by bicycle, and then I used to ride about 31 miles. I had a little shack out on the diggings, and I used to work there. I didn't have trouble selling diamonds because my quality was very good, very big demand. But I never found a big diamond. The biggest I found was a 38 carat. But uh, small diamonds, the medium size of 10s, 12s, 15s, plenty of them. Alluvial diamonds washed from the rock by the rivers were not hard to find. But too many little mines might threaten De Beers' control. Certain companies came and they bought out the small diggers, you see. That's how they developed and became a big company. De Beers bought out everything. Oppenheimer's cartel not only went on buying out the mines, but also took the trouble to mop up stray stones circulating in the villages. A film inspired by De Beers in the 1950s painted a picture of their adventurous young traders setting up buying offices in the bush. These young graduates, Oxford graduates, basically a buying office was them, a bunch of porters with food on their head and a cash box on their head, and they'd put a box down the middle of a clearing, and they'd start buying diamonds in the local currency. So they'd, they'd ship in all these guys to do this, to prevent smuggling. But Ernest Oppenheimer had more to do than just buy up a few odd stones. One unconfirmed rumor suggests that during the depression of the 1930s, the market was so bad, he considered dumping huge quantities of diamonds into the ocean. As recently as 1992, when the rivers dried up in Angola and local people took the chance to pick up thousands of alluvial stones, De Beers are said to have paid $350 million to buy them out. When writer Edward Epstein investigated the diamond trade in the 1970s, he found that De Beers had in the past used countless ways to keep up the illusion that diamonds were rare and valuable. Each time diamonds are found in an inconvenient place, they begin, the diamond cartel, through intermediaries, through law firms they hire, ways to think, how can we prevent these diamonds from reaching the market? And uh, declaring something a national park, uh, tying things up in litigation, these are just the methods. And there's an infinite number of different methods you could use once you understand what the objective is. The objective is to prevent mines from being developed that are outside their control. I wound up on this voyage of discovery, starting off with the idea that there was this object of great value, and that it was just a question of how many could you get out. And I wound up discovering it was just the opposite, that there was an abundance of these, and the problem was stopping them from getting to the market, not getting them to the market.